Welcome to our journey related to understanding of polymeric systems. Uh, in this course, we are looking at uh, the concepts involved in polymers, uh, their properties, the uses and applications and also the overall sustainability aspects. So, in this third week, we are focusing on structure and uh, in this lecture, we will uh, continue looking at uh, the kinetics of crystallization and uh, importantly from the point of view of estimating rates and uh, also figuring out practically how kinetics can influence the overall phenomena of crystallization. And we will do this by first looking at uh, the relevant thermal transitions because this will determine in part the rate of crystallization. The thermodynamics driving force given that Gibbs free energy is lower for the crystalline state below certain temperature that drives crystallization. But the other thermal transition uh, related to molecular flexibility imposes restrictions. So, therefore, we need to be aware of other thermal transitions before we look at the kinetics of crystallization. And uh, once having done uh, looking look at uh, thermal transition, then we will see the rate of crystallization. So, the important uh, transition that we need to be aware uh, is called class transition. And uh, the uh, uh, lectures uh, following this, uh, we will discuss uh, glass transition phenomena in greater detail. But right now, uh, what happens is uh, transition associated with the overall bulk motion of the macromolecule, which means the overall macromolecule itself can move around and therefore, above melt temperature, the polymer is liquid like. So, if I pour uh, polyethylene at 150 degree Celsius, the viscosity will be very high, but still I can pour it like a liquid. And so, there that transition is melting temperature because around 120 to 140 degrees Celsius is the melting temperature of polyethylene. But now, when I start reducing the temperature of polyethylene and I bring it down to room temperature, then we know that it is a solid like material, but it is still flexible. So, therefore, uh, this is uh, where uh, we are still above a transition called the glass transition temperature where the macromolecular flexibility is there. Sometimes, this is also called the alpha transition alpha, beta, gamma is just to indicate that you know there are several mechanisms at the molecular scale and each of them is responsible for one transition. So, therefore, if there are side groups or there are some uh, other conformational changes which are possible, they are associated with uh, beta, gamma transition and they are necessarily smaller scale compared to segments. So, this is uh, again uh, throwing back to the idea that uh, we discussed earlier in terms of multiplicity of time scales of response of macromolecular systems. So, there is the whole macromolecule, then segment and then subsegment. And uh, viscoelasticity of macromolecules is very crucially linked to such uh, multi scale response in time as well as length. So, these transitions are uh, associated uh, importantly uh, with some heat flow change. So, that is a way of measuring also, but that is also an indication if we are trying to use it in some application, we need to know how much does the property change. For example, a mechanical property can change by three orders of magnitude across a glass transition. So, if modulus is in gigapascals below glass transition, it can become megapascals above glass transition. So, three orders of magnitude change, so very, very significant change. Similarly, diffusion of small molecules in polymers can also change. We will also see that uh, electrical properties also change. When we look at impedance, uh, which will be both resistance and capacitance uh, put together, we will see that that also changes when we have all these transitions happening. So, therefore, these changes in properties are important from an application point of view, but equivalently, they also become tools for us to measure these transitions. So, one technique for example, is thermal analysis in which case we are looking at the thermal events in the macromolecular system and the signatures associated with it. So, therefore, heat flow uh, for example, in DSC can be a, a good signature for these transitions. Of course, when we look at a practical uh, polymeric system, there may be other events which are happening which can also be along with these thermal transitions. For example, there may be some polymerization, depolymerization reactions happening, degradation reactions happening. There may be some solvent or small molecules present which may be evaporating. So, a real polymeric system may have several signatures associated with heat flow and then we might have to delink what is associated with these. Similar is the case with mechanical properties and 
any other set of properties. So, the polymer uh, crystallization uh, both the structure and growth of it basically is uh, possible when we look at what happens under a given condition. So, when we have any temperature which is lower than uh, the melt temperature crystallization can happen and that we will refer to as the crystallization temperature. So, if I have polymer above melting temperature no crystallization is possible because their liquid uh, is favored due to lower Gibbs free energy. When we bring it down below melt temperature then Gibbs free energy of the ordered crystalline solid is favorable. The only complication in case of polymers is because of entanglements and uh, macromolecular flexibility 100 percent crystallinity cannot be obtained and therefore, we obtain uh, folded crystals and spherulitic structures. So, therefore, uh, variation of structural parameters is present depending on what is the crystallization temperature. So, let us say if uh, PET uh, is taken to 280 degrees Celsius for molding and uh, then uh, if uh, we bring it down suddenly to 170 degrees Celsius, it will crystallize at 170 degrees Celsius. So, the crystal size that I obtain will be different if I bring it down to 200 degree Celsius and crystallize it. And so, that can be measured using the thickness of the lamella. What you can uh, uh, notice here is uh, depending on the thermal energy and segmental flexibility which is there, the polymers will start folding and the rate at which they fold will depend on the temperature itself. And therefore, the thickness of the fold will also depend on the temperature. And naturally, therefore, the amorphous region thickness will also be different. So, the melting point uh, of these crystals then are also dependent on crystal thickness. So, this is a complication in case of polymers. Notice what I am saying. There is an equilibrium melting temperature, but that is rarely observed. The crystals that are obtained will depend on what temperature crystallization is happening. Now, after these crystals are formed, if I melt them, again melting will happen depending on how these crystals are. If crystals are formed at a lower crystallization temperature, they will also melt at lower melting temperature. So, the other complication in case of polymers is as long as segmental flexibility is there, which means we are above the glass transition temperature, structural changes can happen. And so, if I am keeping the sample close to melting point or below melting point where segmental mobility is there crystals can melt and reform, melt and reform. So, if I make uh, the PET crystals at 160 degrees Celsius and then I heat this sample to 200 degrees Celsius, some of the crystals which are formed at 160 will melt and reform and then I will get a completely different structure at 200 degrees Celsius. So, therefore, there is a dynamics of crystal formation and melting at any condition which is less than melting point but above glass transition temperature. So, therefore, growth rate under any condition will depend on these two temperature differences. So, the crucial uh, temperature differences to keep track are uh, how far away is the crystallization temperature from glass transition temperature because this determines the segmental flexibility. As soon as uh, we reach the glass transition temperature, segments will be frozen uh, the segmental mobility will go to 0 and uh, therefore, uh, crystallization will not be possible. But if we are away from glass transition and higher uh, much higher than glass transition then segmental mobility is higher. On the other hand, the temperature difference between the crystallization temperature and the melt temperature is also an important thermodynamic driving force. If we are above metal th melting temperature of course, no crystallization can take place. So, only when we are lower than melting temperature then crystallization can take place and this difference between Tm and Tc tells us how strong is the driving force for crystallization. So, having seen the importance of temperature uh, at which crystallization is happening with respect to the glass transition temperature on one hand or the melting temperature on the other hand. Now, let us look at uh, the crystallization rate a uh, little more closely. Uh, if we were to plot uh, the crystallization rate as a function of temperature. Uh, what we will notice is uh, that uh, near the melting point, the crystallization rate is lower because the driving force uh, is lower there. And uh, crystallization star rate starts uh, increasing as we uh, go to lower and lower temperature. But as we start approaching uh, glass transition temperature, again the crystallization rate drops. So, somewhere in between, uh, between the two uh, uh, 
transition temperatures, we have the maximum rate of crystal growth. And uh, therefore, it depends on what temperature are the crystals being grown. In case of uh, macromolecular crystallization, the amount of crystallinity that is obtained as well as the structure in terms of the lamella thickness or in terms of spherulite size. So, the morphology or uh, the microstructure of crystalline phase also depends on what temperatures the crystallization is being carried out. Now, one can look at uh, the crystallization in uh, two different ways. Uh, the way uh, we have been discussing where we do crystallization at a fixed temperature. So, for example, we can uh, bring the material at uh, a temperature which is uh, far higher than uh, melting temperature and then uh, cool it down. And so, when we cool it down uh, and uh, to a specific temperature, uh, let us say here uh, T 1. And uh, then what we can do is as soon as we bring it to T 1, crystallization will start, we can measure the amount of crystallinity. So, generally we will uh, define uh, phi c as the uh, fraction of crystallinity which is present in the material at any instant of time. And uh, when we are saying that we are looking at uh, kinetics of crystallization, we are interested in tracking how fast or slow this phi c is increasing. Eventually, uh, when crystallization is complete, this phi c becomes phi c infinity. So, that is the final uh, value of uh, degree of crystallinity in the sample. So, our interest is in looking at how does this ratio vary. This ratio starts out being 0 at time t is equal to 0 and uh, then at uh, time approaches uh, infinite or very large amount of time, there will be value of 1 as a function of time. So, in crystallization kinetics, we are interested in following and uh, finding out what is the rate of crystal growth and how fast or slow the crystallization is happening. And I could uh, do this at a different temperature and uh, note the crystallization uh, rate. So, uh, let us say if uh, I do measurement at another temperature which is T 2 and uh, the rate uh, happens to be faster. And of course, eventually again it will reach some phi c infinity value and therefore, 0 to 1 is the variation. Now, if I ask you uh, on this uh, uh, graph here, where will T 2 be? Uh, will it be left of T 1? In the sense, will it be lower than T, T 1 or will it be higher than T 1? And clearly, since the rate uh, at T 2 is higher, uh, T 2 has to be somewhere in this region. So, therefore, this is the region where uh, T 2 will be because the crystallization rate is higher. So, in case of uh, the crystallization rate will be maximum at T m minus uh, T g by 2, somewhere a midpoint of uh, uh, the range of temperature from uh, glass transition temperature to the melting point temperature. And uh, if we uh, are interested in practical applications, then what happens is we take the sample to this uh, higher than melting point and then we actually will make the sample flow uh, in a mold or uh, in a cast and so on. And uh, so, uh, the uh, temperature is much higher than the melting temperature. And then as soon as mold filling finishes, then the mold is cooled. And so, uh, temperature is uh, decreased uh, at uh, some rate. So, in case of uh, practical applications, uh, the crystallization will happen at different temperatures because sample is being cooled as uh, the uh, uh, temperature changes. So, what we had discussed here uh, is an example of uh, isothermal crystallization and uh, practically what is important is dynamic crystallization. So, in this case also, the uh, sample starts out with 0 crystallinity and then uh, it goes to eventual crystallinity which is phi c infinity. And in this case, uh, we could uh, plot this as a function of time or uh, temperature both and they are related to each other because uh, if we assume let us say there is a constant cooling rate. So, in this case, the uh, time into the cooling rate uh, will give us the uh, temperature. In fact, uh, this is going to be let us say T m minus 
So, uh, when, whenever we are at uh, time t is equal to 0, we are temperature uh, Tm or higher and then when we start uh, going further and further, the temperature will go lower and lower. So, with this, uh, now the question again uh, will be that uh, when we do a cooling rate experiment, the crystallization uh, will happen, the degree of crystallinity will go from 0 to 1. Now, the question is at what temperatures is the crystals being formed? Uh, one thing that you can uh, realize is if I do an extremely high cooling rate, then what happens is the resonance time at uh, the, the temperatures where crystallization is possible is uh, very low. So, therefore, I can take the sample below glass transition and then have it completely amorphous. But let us say I have cooling rates which are uh, most practical cases maybe 20 degrees Celsius a minute or 50 degrees Celsius a minute or 10 degrees Celsius a minute, then crystallization will happen. And uh, now the qu question is what happens at two different cooling rates? So, here I have drawn uh, the uh, curve for uh, let us say a cooling rate of T dot 1. Now, if I draw another uh, curve which is T dot 2. Here you can see that uh, crystallization is happening lot faster. The time required for uh, crystallization is faster. So, let us uh, say that uh, right now we are focusing on uh, x axis as uh, time alone. So, low uh, the time that is required is much lower in case of T 2 dot. Now, can you think and try to justify whether T 1 dot will be greater or T 2 dot will be greater? which is the cooling rate which is higher. So, we can uh, you can think about this and uh, towards the end of the lecture, we will look at uh, the governing equation uh, a simple model and try to again uh, answer this question. So, just to summarize, we can uh, look at crystallization kinetics uh, uh, under isothermal condition and uh, here we cool it instantaneously to a temperature and monitor uh, the degree of crystallinity as a function of time. We could do isothermal crystallization by first quenching so that we go to glassy state and make the material amorphous, then heat it to again a crystallization temperature. In case of uh, dynamic crystallization, which is of course, uh, practically very important, we uh, heat the sample above melt temperature, so that uh, molding can uh, occur, then uh, we make the material flow and finally, cool it at some uh, specified rate. So, let us uh, look at uh, what are the consequences of uh, such uh, range of uh, temperatures over which crystallization can happen. And uh, this we have already seen uh, that uh, the lamella uh, thickness depends on the temperature at which the crystallization happens. And uh, somewhere uh, high temperature, this is where the equilibrium melting temperature is. So, it is this whole range of temperature where crystallization can happen. And uh, uh, just to uh, remind you, uh, this is a question uh, based on uh, exam where what are the characterization techniques which can be used to determine the degree of crystallinity. Uh, in this lecture as well as our uh, two lectures earlier when we had discussed the amorphous and crystalline states, we have had a uh, lot of discussion related to order in the material and also related to thermal signatures. So, I am sure uh, you will be quickly able to answer this question. So, when we come back to this, so crystallization let us say happened at two different temperatures in the sample. And uh, so, uh, uh, at uh, this temperature, the thickness of the crystal is different compared to thickness of this crystal. So, microstructurally, the two crystals are different. Now, if I heat these samples and melt them, again the melting will also be at different temperatures. So, the, uh, uh, the crystals which were formed at a higher temperature will melt at a slightly higher temperature. And only if we do crystallization exceedingly slowly, theoretically, then we can do crystallization at T m infinity or and melting also at T m infinity. So, most practical cases, uh, there is a range of temperature over crystallization and melting takes place. Another thing to just uh, remind ourselves is given that there is order and disorder uh, in the crystalline and amorphous states, uh, the bonds which are available, whether it is a carbon hydrogen bond or carbon oxygen bond or any of the bonds. Uh, whether they belong to an ordered structure or a disordered structure, they have different spectroscopic signatures. So, even techniques like uh, IR spectroscopy or uh, NMR spectroscopy uh, 
can be used to uh, look at the crystallization. And so, uh, let us now uh, uh, finish this uh, lecture by looking at uh, a simple uh, set of models. And uh, to, to do look at this model, uh, we need to quickly again recap as to how we have said is the picture of crystallization. Uh, what we have been saying uh, is that uh, crystallization happens where uh, there are a few nuclei form and then uh, growth uh, happens. Uh, there is uh, also uh, another uh, mechanism of uh, crystallization uh, which is important for some material systems and uh, we will uh, have a chance to discuss this even when we discuss uh, polymer blends. And so, this is uh, generally two different mechanisms of uh, phase transformations in thermodynamics, nucleation and growth where some places nuclei are formed and then growth occurs and then spinodal decomposition where simultaneously throughout the sample uh, structure forms. You can see why this is important when I have described some places nuclei starting and then growing as opposed to everywhere in the sample spinodal decomposition leading to crystalline and amorphous phases in a co-continuous manner. Now, once these two crystallization processes happen, the final material that we get morphology or microstructure is very different. So, from an engineering point of view, uh, it is of interest uh, for us to know which nucleation, which mechanism is followed. So, let us uh, look at nucleation and growth, uh, which is uh, what uh, happens uh, practically most of the time. Uh, we have the thermodynamic uh, driving force uh, for crystallization as soon as sample is brought below the melting temperature. However, whenever we have a sample and uh, let us say there are few places where uh, nucleation uh, started uh, or crystal formed because there is a driving force. So, in these few places uh, molecules start ordering which means a crystal starts appearing. However, what happens as soon as a crystal appears is there is now an interface being created, a phase boundary being created. So, there is an interface of interface between uh, crystal and melt and this requires energy. There is an interfacial energy associated with it. So, what happens is this uh, ordered crystals again actually go back to the melt. So, this process uh, is a dynamic process and this keeps on happening. However, few places the crystal goes beyond a certain critical size and then a nucleus is formed. So, nucleus formation, nucleus is formed in some locations. You might ask, uh, how do I know what is the density of nuclei formation? And uh, the answer again there is depending on the driving force. The further away from melting point we are, the more will be the number of nuclei. And uh, this again uh, will uh, try to give you a picture that if crystallization happens at lower temperature, lot more nuclei will be there, the spherulitic size will be small. On the other hand, if we do crystallization close to melting temperature, then the number of nuclei will be less and spherulitic size will be more. Why am I saying that? Because let us say these are the few places where uh, nuclei have uh, formed and uh, so what happens is now growth can happen. So, on these nuclei now, crystal starts growing. So, in uh, just to recap, uh, melt and crystal keep on forming and reforming everywhere in the sample. Because of driving force, crystallization happens, but because of interfacial energy, the uh, crystal melts. But in few locations, which we call nuclei, are formed. And once nuclei are formed, then uh, spontaneous growth can happen. And so, now these locations, spherulitic structures or whatever may be the morphology of growth that can start. If, if, uh, if this drawing was there and the way I am drawing and uh, thing basically starting at a point and then growing in space 
I don't know if you can recall of a similar situation. Uh, this is a month of uh, June uh, here while, while I'm doing this recording and monsoon is the time. And so I don't know whether you can correlate this with rain. And uh, if you think closely, if you look at a trough of water and if some drops are falling and then waves which are formed and propagate out, the picture I have drawn is very similar to that. And in fact, so the crystallization kinetics model that was initially proposed was based on uh, the analysis uh, which was done for the, what is the area being covered by the waves of the raindrops. So if you start initially, as soon as raindrop falls, it covers very small area, but then the waves propagate out. So as the time increases, the more and more area of the trough is covered by the waves of the raindrop. So this is what is happening here also. Initially, the area covered is uh, very small where near the nuclei and then eventually when the growth starts happening more and more area is covered by the crystallite regions. So this uh, model is called the Avrami model and so this is the Avrami model which was based on uh, such consideration and it uh, talks about how uh, ratio of crystallinity from 0 will go to 1 as a function of time. And uh, the important parameters are the rate constant for the process and the exponent. And the exponent depends on what is the nature and geometry of the crystals that are present. And if you look at the model for uh, dynamic crystallization, it's similar based on similar arguments, but instead of time, we have now the cooling rate. And so if uh, cooling rate is very fast, what happens? If cooling rate is exceedingly slow, what happens? If cooling rate is very fast, then what happens? So if cooling rate is very fast, you can see that uh, this factor will go to 1 and therefore there will be no crystallinity. So therefore, uh, you can try now going back to the slide and see if two different cooling rates are there, one faster than the other, uh, at what uh, you can try to justify and uh, figure out whether the red one was faster cooling rate or the black one was faster cooling rate. So with this, uh, we will close uh, this uh, lecture and uh, I am sure you all of you uh, know the answer to the question because we have discussed sufficiently that scanning colorimetry, differential scanning colorimetry and X-ray scattering and diffraction are the two most important techniques to measure crystallization in samples. So with this uh, we have uh, concluded our discussion uh, related to understanding of uh, crystallization in, uh, in macromolecules. Now in uh, next uh, few set of lectures, we will look at glass transition in much more detail because though we have introduced glass transition and it seems to be related to segmental mobility of the material and uh, it prevents crystallization from happening, but what is meant by glass transition and what is this glass transition temperature? So we will have a discussion related to understanding of glass transition. Thank you.